Sejam bem-vindos a mais um Cubicast. Este que vos fala é João Brito, seu host favorito do Cubicast. E se você está caindo aqui de paraquedas, este é um podcast em português, normalmente. E ele é mantido pela GetUp. Se você não conhece, GetUp.io, nós somos uma empresa é, que presta serviços de Kubernetes, Professional Services para Kubernetes. Nós somos especialistas no Kubernetes desde que o Kubernetes nasceu. A gente já estava lá. Se você precisa de ajuda, se você precisa de suporte, se você precisa abstrair essa parte ou quer evoluir o seu time, trazer uns braços a mais para a sua operação, entre em contato conosco. Mas uh, a gente não para por aí. Nós desenvolvemos também projetos open source tá? para a administração de Kubernetes. Nesse momento, nós temos três projetos open source. O Cell Playground, tá? o Zora, que é o nosso scan de vulnerabilidades, e o Marvin, né? que é a engine que faz esse scan todo funcionar. Se você não se conhece, quiser ter mais alguns detalhes, geran.io barra open source, tá? E você pode testar, você pode usar aí na sua, no seu ambiente, tá bom? E eu tenho certeza que ele vai trazer insights uh, muito importantes para você, não só de vulnerabilidades, mas também daquelas configurações que de repente passaram desapercebido dentre os diversos ambientes que você tem, tá bom? Fica ligado, mas falando sobre o episódio de hoje, eu tenho a honra de receber duas lendas, Darren Shepard e Shannon Williams. Eles são diretores, co-founders da Acorn.io. Ah, bom, esse episódio vai ser diferente, ele vai ser em inglês. Então, já quero pedir desculpas pelo meu inglês meia boca ou half mouth, porque eles não sabem português. Mas, é, se você não os conhece, você deve conhecer o produto anterior, que é o Suzy Ranger. Tá? Você com certeza já trombou com o Rancher aí em algum momento. Então, eles só são os criadores do Rancher. É uma entrevista muito legal. Eu tenho certeza que você vai aprender coisas com a experiência desses caras e como eles estão construindo essa, essa plataforma, tá bom? Então, acorn.io é a plataforma que eles estão construindo, é uma startup. E eu tive a oportunidade de conversar com eles. Vocês podem seguir aqui a nossa, o nosso episódio. Se você estiver só ouvindo esse episódio, tiver alguma dificuldade com o inglês, eu vou pedir ajuda para o meu time aqui para a gente é, legendar tudo isso lá no YouTube. Então, você pode pegar todos os detalhes com mais facilidade, tá bom? É isso, vamos para o episódio Mudando para Inglês agora! Now um, I have the pleasure to uh, have Shannon and Darren here, and I will let um, you both uh, introduce yourself for our audience. Maybe Darren first, and after Shannon. Okay. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Darren Shepard, uh, a co-founder of Acorn, I'm chief architect. Uh, you might know me on Twitter as I Build the Cloud. That's where most people seem to know me of me ranting there, um, but. Uh, Yeah, so co-founder, chief architect, previously did Rancher and um, I created K3S. That's the other thing you might know me from, so. Okay, nice. And I'm Shannon Williams. Uh, it's great to be here. I, uh, I'm also a co-founder of Acorn and a co-founder of Rancher. I've been working with Darren for the last 10, 15 years. So uh, yeah, we're excited to be here. Excited to talk about uh, Kubernetes, Acorn, Rancher, really anything, whatever you guys want to chat about. Okay, nice. Oh, let's start talking about Acorn, okay? In a few words, um, how you describe Acorn for those who never heard about or are searching now, acorn.io, how do you describe in a few words? Yeah, I mean, Acorn is a way to run containers. Uh, I mean, really what we have just launched in acorn.io is a cloud built you know, from the ground up for people who love to work with containers, who want to work, you know, almost, you know, in a way that feels very authentic to people who work on containers every day. And so I think as a, you know, it's heavily influenced by our time working on Rancher. You know, we spent years helping people build Kubernetes clusters, run Kubernetes clusters, scale Kubernetes clusters. But over time, we started to feel that there was, you know, a real, uh, a real challenge in just handing Kubernetes over to application teams. Uh, specifically, it felt a lot like handing someone the kernel to Linux without any kind of operating system. And so what 
we wanted to build with Acorn was exactly that. It's like an operating system for Kubernetes. And so last year we introduced the Acorn Runtime, which is an open source project that we think of as as exactly that, an operating system for Kubernetes, a way to manage deployments, manage applications with an interface that's oriented towards the application development team and that provides discrete area specific, specifically for apps instead of for infrastructure uh, decisions. And this year we're launching that experience as a cloud, as a, a front end for people to consume not just you know the containers they want to run, but also the cloud services they want to use. And I think a lot of it came really from how difficult we found um, teaching Kubernetes, how difficult we found training Kubernetes, and really how many problems we found upgrading Kubernetes once people started using it to power their applications as they kind of started doing privileged containers and CRDs and, and diving into operators and, you know, kind of going and using Kubernetes scheduling capabilities all the way through their application, um, we started to realize that upgrading clusters was becoming more and more and more difficult. And we needed to really, when possible at least, um, put applications into a place that's independent of Kubernetes and um, abstracted from Kubernetes a bit. And that's what drove Acorn. And we just love working on it. We love working with it. I mean, Darren's been at the core of this from the beginning. You know, Darren, you maybe you can talk about the journey towards Acorn, kind of what inspired you to build it. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, so I, I mentioned in the introduction, I, I created a K3S. And so I've all, I, you know, it's like, I know these technologies well, but I fundamentally just want them kind of to be easy. And um, kind of like where I got started, you know, on this journey with with Acorn was I was trying to run a Minecraft server for my my son. So like I, I thought I'm like, oh I'll, let me deploy K3S and then I'll put the Minecraft server on it. This was just on a you know a computer at home. And I got so frustrated with the experience of like just getting that simple thing up and running. Because it was like something I just wanted to do real quickly for my son. And uh that like I got so frustrated with that, I'm like, forget it, I'm just gonna go back to Docker Compose. It was way easier. So I, I switched to Docker Compose and I was able to get it up and running in, you know, basically like 20 minutes and 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 that was fine. I'm like you know, it's, it's ridiculous. I have all this powerful technology, you know, we've done, done all stuff. It's like K3S made it so easy to run Kubernetes, like on a single host or whatever. And still it's like, it's so difficult to run an application on top of it. And so that's where, you know, kind of my kind of journey started with like, there's got to be a better way that, that, that we can do this. There's, there's got to be a, a, a way that we can kind of like harness the power of, of Kubernetes, but make it significantly easier to use because it's like, you know, something like Docker Compose is like, it's very nice user experience. People understand it; they can get things running real quickly, but it's completely like disconnected to like production. Like you can really only use it for like kind of like a toy thing um, or for development, but not actually for production. So it's like, how can we take that kind of simplicity of user experience, which clearly like developers understand because they're using, you know, that, that tool a lot, but then connect that to, you know, production and, 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 you know, not just make a little dev toy. So Acorn maybe is more like a, a platform for abstract Kubernetes and this ecosystem, uh, this huge ecosystem that turned things more and more difficult. But um, how do you think uh, will be the next next features? Um, you think um, Acorn will turn more to uh, Google Cloud Run or Amazon ECS or backstage something? I mean, so for me, when I look at kind of the future of Acorn and what, what um, you know, we're trying to do with it, I really focus in on like kind of two things is like one is I care a lot about kind of the portability is um, this is just something I was just ranting about on Twitter recently is like developers always like this idea of remote development or whatever. But really what you, the, the key thing you get out of remote development is portability. You can move your development anywhere you want. It can be remote, it can be local, whatever. But then also you can, with portability, you can, you know, run on any cloud too. But also fundamentally with that is like, I want something that's portable, but I also want to connect development with production. Those are like two things that I see are very, like pretty much all tech stacks that you look at. It's kind of like, this is how I develop. And then this is how I deploy production. They're two different stories. And it's kind of like whatever persona you play, you start from one side or to the other, and it's very disconnected everywhere. So it's like, so when you say like, where do I think Acorn's going? It's like, well, I don't necessarily want to be a cloud run because to me, it's like cloud run is focused completely on 
just the production side of running a container. Like, how do I develop that container? You know, it's like, it, like there's, there's so many solutions that are very pointed. And that's kind of, to me, like the problem I see with the entire s- story of everything is like, everyone is like basically drowning under the fact that it's like, first, I got to figure out all the madness of developing. Like the JavaScript world is crazy. Like learning all of like, <laughs> like, you know, so many people, JavaScript's like the number one language, but it's like the most crazy ecosystem to learn. Once I figure all of that out, how the heck do I deploy it? It's a whole new set of like discipline and whatnot to deploy it. And so it's like, it's not so much that like, so I don't want to like, I want to basically connect this all into one simple portable experience. And so it's like, that's where we're trying to go with Acorn is kind of like collapse because it's like, I don't think there's something like it's so fundamentally different. The idea of like running your application uh, locally for development and running your application in production. Why can't it be basically the same thing? Like we introduce so many problems with the fact that like, you know, it's like, oh no, development, I just use these, like these kind of local emulated services, but in production, I do it this way, you know? So it's like consolidating the whole thing together. So it's like where we're going with Acorn, I think is, I don't know, honestly, I think it's somewhere no one's really gone before because we're really trying to to uh, bring these two sides of the house together into like one more co- cohesive solution, like dev and production, like bring this all together. I think in a lot of ways, a, a good way to think of it too is the, you know, that operating system model um, really is driving our thinking, right? As we imagine sort of how to deliver Acorn, it's very important to us that we started with an open source project. We needed to deliver, you know, kind of a runtime that would work on any Kubernetes that was not tied to a cloud, was not a cloud service in and of itself for there to be, you know, really any chance of it becoming that type of Kubernetes operating system. But once we did that, and once we started to see people beginning to run this on Kubernetes clusters and beginning to expose it to their users, I think what we realized very quickly was that the the operating system you know, needed ecosystem, right? It needed things around it. You couldn't, it couldn't just be an operating system at the cluster level. It really needed to exist at a level of collaboration. It needed to exist at a level, almost at the same level as a cloud where people are able to easily get resources, easily share things, easily spin stuff up. And so one of the reasons we decided to launch Acorn the cloud service side, it was really geared around how to give more people exposure to this and how to make it easier for people to work together. Shen, our co-founder, really championed this idea of Acorn should be free for anyone to develop with. You know, this, uh, you know, kind of really inspired by GitHub, the, uh, you know, everyone who wants one should be able to have an Acorn account. They should be able to have resources to use Acorn. And so one of the things we've done with Acorn is we've included in any account, anyone who just signs up, they get this, um, ephemeral environment where they can create containers whenever they want, where they can deploy their Acorn images whenever they want. The Acorn, the images are always destroyed. Nothing lasts in it. It's always, you know, two hours, you know, anything you deploy is killed after two hours, but really creates a place where developers can very easily push workloads from local to the cloud against real resources with real IP addresses, with real data services behind them, with easy connections to cloud data services and see how technology technology works when it's deployed. And that really gets to what Darren is talking about, the the journey from the laptop and the development experience locally to seeing these things running in the cloud and then iterating on them, sharing them, you know, making changes, seeing how those are impacted in the real world. Because I think I think we have really this bifurcation, this split that Darren's talking about between the operations and the development, the cloud and the laptop, the developer and the en- the engineers running the platforming side, the platform side, like these splits, we've been talking about it forever. That was the whole point of DevOps. And yet I'm not sure we're that much closer than we've ever been. We have CI, CD, you know, we have agile, we have scrums, we have standups, like we talk more, which I think is good. But we still, it's like we're we're talking using uh, really old technology, like we're talking over uh, Morse code or something. Like we're not using the same language. We have to have a translator constantly between us. So with a new operating system, we're trying to like I think we're pretty heavily inspired by things like iOS, right? This idea of you know a powerful 
a device, a powerful platform for us as the cloud with a standardized interface that anyone can build apps on. And the, the operations team can understand that those apps are going to behave in a certain way, that by being part of this, they can be upgraded very easily. They can handle an upgrade very easily. They can be secured very easily. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I, even if Acorn only tackles 90% of workloads out there, I, I think it'll have a massive impact, maybe even less. I think it'll have a massive impact on the operational weight of Kubernetes on organizations and the educational time required to learn and, and consume all these things. I mean, and then, I mean, if you say like 90% or whatever, you have to consider it's like within large organizations that have adopted Kubernetes, like a lot of them are, you know, 20, 30% of their workloads, you know, might be on Kubernetes and they struggle to get the last 70%. You know, it's like it, the it's a powerful platform, but it's definitely difficult to onboard onboard people, you know, so it's like, you know, we can definitely, you know, see it's like if we can kind of simplify this platform, we can get a lot more, you know, applications on this or whatever. So we basically expand the footprint of, of Kubernetes. In my experience, Ranger, I always been a uh, operation, uh, operations guy. So in my experience, Ranger become the, to make operations on top of Kubernetes easier. In other side, platforms like Head Head OP Shift are more um, on the developer side. Ranger um, become a little more creating some uh, interactions to deploy, but I always see this for a uh, DevOps team. And how you think your experience with Ranger and deploying or creating this huge tool bring you here to create um, this developer experience or this platform to get this real together devops i don't know yeah i think it's a i think it's very informative for us i mean we you know when we built rancher we really you know we we were really out there on the edge of open source right building open source projects um for everyone to use and, and one of the things that we found early on was that the way people were implementing kubernetes was really different and the way they're implementing rancher was really different so we really did always through Rancher sort of think of Rancher as a very native implementation of Kubernetes. We didn't want to modify Kubernetes too much. We didn't want to put a lot of opinion on top of Kubernetes because at the time, you know, the Kubernetes ecosystem was changing really fast. You know, we weren't really sure what the final outcome of this would be and what type of tools people would want to run on top of it. And I think we found that, you know, when we looked around the ecosystem, that was a pretty common approach. You know, you look at, at the cloud-based Kubernetes, the EKSs, the Azures, the Googles. I mean, they were generally rolling out Kubernetes very natively. And OpenShift was kind of the exception, right? OpenShift, because it came from a very PaaS background, um, it had this approach that was very much oriented towards give us your JBoss applications and we'll help you sort of with build packs and we'll we'll kind of develop those applications so you don't even have to to talk. We didn't really, you know, one of the three things we saw over the years as we as we implemented was that that approach that I would call the pivotal approach, the cloud foundry approach, the the sort of traditional paths approach, it had a pretty significant limitations, right? It, it really tended to drive out a lot of choice at the you know, at the development level. It meant, you know, in most ways, it was oriented towards a very specific understanding of how to build an application, what database to use, what application architecture to use, how to run an application. And so I think that, you know, we've seen over the last few years that those platforms haven't really grown in popularity. The Heroku's of the world, uh, the, you know, cloud foundries of the world, they've kind of struggled to adapt to a world that's so dynamic as what we see in actual software development. And so we were, we were always pretty skeptical of PaaS as an answer. And I think that really informed Acorn. We didn't want to build a PaaS. We didn't want to build a platform where we chose the database and we chose, you know, the languages we were going to support. And we had a very specific, you know, this is the way we're going to approach Java and this is the way we're going to approach Go and this is how we're going to build what we we kind of feel like that side actually developers are very good at um, CICD, uh, you know, building images like what, getting to a container has never really been the challenge, right? Getting to a container when you saw Docker come to market. It was developers who loved it the most at the beginning, right? This ability to package up 
all of their dependencies and, and run locally, share with one another. So I think there's a fallacy in the model that Paz took on, which was to say that all developers want to do is hand you a jar file and stop caring about their application. That's not what I see at all in the real world of developers. What I see is developers are architects and craftsmen who put together technology. And more than any one other thing, what they want is access to a rich palette, right? They want to be able to paint with the coolest colors, right? All the They want to be able to use the latest databases. They want to choose the languages. They want to bring together all of the external cool services that exist in the world. And so that is really why we wanted to build this way. And I think it, it really affected our opinion at, at Rancher as well. We were just, we were really skeptical that the right answer looked like Cloud Foundry. We didn't really, you know, people loved it. There were people who, who swore by it. There were especially big enterprises who felt like by standing standardizing development, they could get great efficiency. And I'm sure all those things are true, but it didn't resonate with us as as people who worked every day with engineers. It didn't really align with how we saw people building applications. We were Docker fans. We loved containers. We loved the, the ability to sort of pick your tools, pull them together and make them happen. So with Acorn, our overriding goal was not to break that, not to take build something that that limited what you could, you know, the tools you could use to paint with, the colors you could paint with. And so, I mean, Darren, you can kind of elaborate on this, but to me, that's what, that's why it was really at Rancher, we were pretty convinced we didn't want to build this layer. And at Acorn, it felt perfectly natural to build this layer. Now that Kubernetes is consistently available in the cloud with a consistent API, that cluster API has made deploying clusters very simple for almost anyone. And even tools like OpenShift look a lot more like Rancher now than they looked like it when they first came out, right? Their their main function is provisioning container clusters, not necessarily providing a, a, a specific interface to them. So we, we think that that layer that Rancher sits at is going to look a lot like Rancher for the long run, that the Kubernetes clusters are going to be stamped out. They're going to be, you know, kind of configured by platform engineers to meet compliance requirements, but that the experience building on them needs to improve and for it to really go beyond five, 10% of, of an organization's workloads to become, you know, the primary way people build things and the place you migrate stuff to. So yeah, like our journey, you know, it's like our journey with Ranch, our journey with Acorn is it's like, I don't know, like the way I approach these things is like, I'm fundamentally a, a user. It's like, I'm a user of this technology. That's why I rant so much on Twitter is like, I'm trying to use something and I get frustrated because I can't get it to work. And so when we were doing uh, Rancher, it was like, what were our users struggling with at the time? It was just standing up Kubernetes. It's like they just, they had a difficult time getting Kubernetes clusters in place. And so like, that's what, you know, as a company, what we ended up focusing on is basically helping people run Kubernetes. And so, you know, we helped a lot of companies do that, but also the whole industry, everyone, you know, is doing the same thing. And, you know, we're to the point now that like getting a Kubernetes cluster is not a particularly difficult. I mean, it's it's still more difficult than I would like, but you can pretty much get a Kubernetes cluster anywhere. But like once we got those clusters, it's like, okay, people spent like a year or so within their company deploying clusters. Then they figured out it's like, oh, well, this, this is like not the end of the road because once they try to onboard applications and give it to development teams, then they realize that that's almost a more difficult problem than standing up the clusters, how to use the cluster. And so, you know, so that's like kind of what's really informed us with Acorn is like there's two sides of this is one is like we clearly need a solution above Kubernetes. The answer is not give developers Kubernetes style YAML. Like that is not like we tried that. I had a project called Rio. And, and I did not like the outcome of it. I, I tried my best and I gave up on it because I'm like, this is just not the right interface. So it's clear we need something above Kubernetes because this is like a raw platform, very powerful, but we need something above it. But the second thing that we also realized is like, we stamped out enough of these clusters that like the cluster itself should pretty much be like self-driving. Like we've learned enough like best practices and experiences and whatnot is like this, the operations of those clusters should just get to the point where it's like, it's kind of like today I can get a VM from, from uh, Amazon and I don't care about the hypervisor or the physical server. Like that should be like the cluster. Like, who cares about that cluster anymore? I want the capabilities of it, but like the operations and stuff can be completely standardized. Um, so like, that's like kind of like other, other thing that, that we've, we've recognized is like, you know, basically by like putting this layer on top, the bottom layer, the operation side can just become so much easier. Talking about that and, you know, um, talk about compliance and I want to ask about 
security and best practice because it's not a new concern but first people are thinking about put their apps online uh, and then they are concerning about security and if they uh, obey best practices or policies how you think um or how we can uh, can help with this or to warning users or developers that they forgot or they are doing something wrong before they go to production. Uh, because in Kubernetes, everything is possible, even do the wrong thing. I think this is the beauty of Linux and Kubernetes. They literally permit that you do the wrong thing. But in production, this could be uh, harmful to your company, right? So it's interesting from a security perspective because to a certain degree, like Kubernetes introduced a lot of security issues. Because like if you if you take a, a, a container, like a regular Docker container, not privileged, just like a regular Docker container, for the most part, it's pretty secure. Ignoring uh, host bind mounts, like binding and things or whatever. But like for the most part, like a container is pretty pretty well contained as long as you trust like the isolation of a of a container, which is which is pretty darn good. So the complexity of like security with Kubernetes is that Kubernetes is a platform that will do absolutely anything. So it's like it's running applications, but it's also managing infrastructure. So it has built into it all of the privilege access to the underlying system. So it can do things like, you know, deploy uh, networking systems and storage drivers and load eBPF modules. And, like it, it does everything. So it's like so it, it be, it's this super powerful platform. But because it can do everything and it's kind of like, you know, open by default, basically insecure by default is that like you get Kubernetes and then you have to plug all the holes and then try to make it work for for applications. So it's like with Acorn, we're completely focused on the use case of running an application. Like if you want to, you know, manage networking or do system stuff, that's not what Acorn's for. Like that, you should just go down to the Kubernetes layer and do that. So it's kind of like Acorn by default is just kind of pretty much secure and it takes care of all of the like kind of RBAC multi-tenancy. Like like it's extremely difficult to come up with an RBAC model uh, to allow multi-tenancy on a cluster because, you know, the... That this blending of like the APIs that are system oriented and user oriented. So it's like when we did this, when we built like Acorn on top of on top of uh, Kubernetes, is Acorn is still under the hood, still a Kubernetes, you know, their CRDs like basically it's just a Kubernetes API. But we locked it down to just one API group. So like the only API group you have to give to an end user is our API group, which is designed from the beginning to be secure by default. So it's like you could just grant you know all verbs and all resources in this API group to someone. And they can't do anything terrible. You like they can't destroy. So it's like it gets down to the point that like the platform is secure by default. You know, then at the biggest, then the biggest problem at that point is is like is your application secure? <laughs> Which you know none of these platforms. You know, it's like you know a SQL injection or something like that. But like the platform is basically just secure by default. And and you can do this without you know really getting in the developer's way because it's like if you're just focused on applications like they don't need all this this crazy uh host level stuff like the thing with kubernetes is that like kind of the devops crowd picked it up and then wanted to run like their monitoring you know things that are like low level they wanted the holes in the system okay and you know this uh aqua 3v scan for images or something yeah uh, is there a way to plug this into acorn or you think it's better to do these in our pipelines or in this CICD? When it comes to kind of image scanning and, and software scan, like software vulnerability scanning, nothing is really fundamentally different about Acorn. Like when you build an Acorn app, we produce an OCA artifact. And then like that OCA artifact is then linked to all the Docker images. And you can use like Trivi to scan that or any, any of these uh, scanning tools. So we don't really fundamentally change anything there. I mean, I think the best approach that people have is like it should be like a dual headed approach, which is basically scan during CI so that you can basically gate the deployment of things of like don't push things that you know are bad. But then also you need to have runtime scanning to know if something like if there's a new CVE, what are the new things? You know, so it's like I think it should just kind of be a fundamental part of the underlying cluster that you have kind of an agent that's scanning scanning these things. So it's like nothing really kind of fundamentally changes there with, with Acorn. Okay. And with the open source and the Acorn runtime, I can control the other things 
on the cluster, um, like you said, uh, monitoring and these runtime tools, uh, scannings, and I don't know, uh, other back of tooling that we have on the ecosystem. Yeah. So there's so there's two models with Acorn of like there's the Acorn runtime which is the open source and then we have the Acorn.io which is our hosted. So for the 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 runtime anyone can pick that up and run that on a Kubernetes cluster and like the architecture and the design of how it all works under the head, under the hood is all kind of Kubernetes standard native things. So if you understand Kubernetes in the administration perspective, you can kind of tweak it and tailor it to your needs of like what storage solution are you going to use? What networking solution? What monitoring solution? What, you know, how are you going to get TLS certificates? Because it's all built on top of standard Kubernetes components. Because people ask like, how do I write like a kind of like a, a driver to Acorn? And it's like, well, there's, we don't really have a framework because it's just Kubernetes. Kubernetes allows you to you know, do web hooks or whatever. And, and so you can just integrate. So from an administrative side, Acorn has all of this flexibility of like, you know, pretty much anything from the Kubernetes ecosystem pretty much still applies to Acorn because we're just sitting on top and, and providing this nice user experience to the end users. Okay, nice. And uh, I have a last question. It's about the future. Is there such a, what do you think Acorn will become? What the Acorn goals for the future we are near to 1224 so what will be the future of of acorn you know i think and when we think about the future we're <laughs> we're we're always pretty short focused um we're really focused on the near term because we're startup we're 20 people we're banging our head against tough problems right now the stuff that we're excited about is all about portability it's about cost management it's about making the development operations connection easier so like you know today we've really started to uh, the first implementation of acorn cloud runs fully on aws right it uses aws for all of our services we run acorn on aws and when we provide infrastructure it's aws infrastructure but by next year we want that to be beautifully multi cloud right we want to be providing infrastructure regions across clouds everywhere we want to be able to to not just deploy containers into those clouds, we want to take advantage of the cool cloud services that exist in those clouds so that as a developer, when you're working in AWS, you can use RDS. When you move over to Azure, you can use the local database, the MariaDB services there. You can easily tap into cloud scale things like uh, you know, Neon or Planet Scale or MongoDB Atlas or Redis Cloud. We want we want to sort of begin to standardize the consumption of these different versions of the same open source elements, whether they're Kubernetes or their databases or their queues or whatever. And so, you know, a lot of ways we really feel like for the first time, I mean, we, Darren and I have been working on cloud computing since 2008, you know, maybe before that even, and really dealing with this challenge of how to build multi-cloud, you know, kind of services. And it's been really hard. Kubernetes, Docker was supposed to help us fix it. Kubernetes was host supposed to help us fix it. And yet we're still in ecosystems that are very static, very hard to move. And so, you know, we can't help but kind of dive back into those problems and look at things like, why can't we easily move things around? Why can't I, I deploy anywhere wherever I want? Darren, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, it's like we've been on this like cloud journey for like, I don't know, 15 plus years or whatever. And Shannon and I, we, I don't know how long have we been working? Almost, you know, it's like 13 years or something. We, we've been working together. And it's like, I remember in, in like the early days, there was like this big thing about like hybrid cloud, you know, you're going to have your application here and burst to the cloud or move to, and it was complete nonsense. Like it was just not possible with the current technology. And here we are 13 years later. And it's like, this is actually, it's, it's very like, it is very, uh, like we can actually do this. And that's, that's what I'm more excited. Cause like, I've always wanted this, like just kind of ubiquitous, like, you know, it's like compute is pretty much a commodity. I can just run it anywhere. And we're so close to getting that of like, it doesn't really matter if it's like, if it's on my laptop, if it's in AWS, Azure or whatever, it's like pretty much the same thing can run everywhere. It's like, I get really excited about the idea of portability. And, and it's like, so the two things that I care most about is like, it's portability. And basically I want, to connect development and production. Like, I don't want those to be two completely different disciplines. I want that, you know, want to bring that back together. 
And so it's like, if I'm developing my application or if I'm running in production, it, it's the same thing. It's just a different scale. It's a different, you know, like, I think we can bring this all together. And we've, and as I was saying, like, we've been doing this for like 15 plus years or whatever of like, it's like, we've seen enough patterns. We've seen enough examples. It's like, while everyone thinks like the way they do it is like unique and different, it's like things are a lot more similar than they are different. And I, I really think there's a chance to greatly simplify this entire story. And at the end of the day, like that simplification translates into, you know, greater agility, more cost savings and all that stuff. Yeah. But from my point of view, multi-cloud is still a dream. It's not working like uh, we see in a lot of slides or uh, over the years. You think the worst problem is because cloud providers don't want to help and they uh, make some barriers. Uh, so this is become difficult. I mean, there's, there's not exactly an incentive for, let's say, like AWS to make it easy for you to run on Azure. When I look at this, you know, I think the, the you know, it's like Amazon, What their, their biggest killer thing is still EC2. That's where they're making all, all of their money. You know, so like the main functionality that you're getting out of Amazon is is EC2. It's, the, it's like it's the CPU storage networking. It's the core compute. You know, so it's like we're at the point that like the core compute is can be pretty much completely commoditized and abstracted with Kubernetes. So once I get the core compute, then what's left after that? Well, like the other key offering, like for example, AWS is is like like RDS and they have a couple application services that are really, really good. But all the other cloud vendors basically have the same thing. You're like, you're trying to get like, like their version of some open source thing, you know? So it's like, I want my SQL, you know, what's the one the cloud gives you? So it's like, if, if I have a little bit of a abstraction layer over some of these like legacy services, then that portability happens. And then most of the stuff going forward, future wise, if you look really future is more SaaS based. It's like, so okay, once I get my core thing of like, I need core compute and I need a, and, and I need a database, like databases are kind of the stickiest thing. Once I get those two in place, then it's just a bunch of SaaS, it's like SaaS APIs and whatnot. And it's kind of like, well, where does it really matter where I run? Like, you're just going to pick the one that's like closest and best or whatever. So it's like, maybe you're, you're using open API. So it's like, well, I'm going to run in Azure because open API is going to run the best in Azure's cloud because that's where it's hosted or something like that. Open AI. Oh, sorry. Open AI, not open API. Sorry. Open AI. <laughs> so yeah, open AI. So it's like, so, so that's what you're saying is like, I, I think like, you know, I don't think when we talk about like hybrid or portable portability, it's so much about like seamlessly moving your workloads around. It's just that like, I can pick where I run. It's like, I can run this here. I can run it on edge. I can run it on my laptop. I can choose where it is. And I'm not changing my technology stack. I'm not re-architecting the thing. I'm not, you know, it's like, it's pretty much just like, okay, tweak some settings. And like, now I'm running there. We're like, in like, we definitely don't have that today. If like you use Terraform and deploy to AWS, that, you know, that doesn't help you then move to Azure. You have to reinvent the world on Azure. But like, I think we can, we can, we can get there. And we're so, so close to it because so much of the technology and stack, like it's, it's all like, everyone's pretty much offering the same things now. So it's like, Kubernetes gives us this great layer to kind of... For the end of the episode, do you have one or two tips for developers or DevOps teams that want to use uh, Acorn and want to try it on SaaS or our own clusters? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say right now, go sign up for a, a, a standard account on Acorn Cloud. It's free. It's easy to get a feel for how to build Acorn images. You can find the library of them. You can see great docs on how to build them. Start there, expose it to more people, like give people that, um, you know, create an image and share it and let people launch the images, like get comfortable with the Acorn model, because I think you're going to find it so intuitive. If you know Docker, if people are comfortable with Docker, they're going to find Acorn really intuitive. And so that's my big tip. Start, start in the cloud, get comfortable with it, deploy the runtime in your Docker desktop environment, um, you know, sort of see how easy it is to run locally. All this stuff will will make, you know, you're not the first place you're not going to run this is probably your production clusters. We're still building it. It's it's still um, we're, we're kind of getting close to removing the beta tag from the runtime, but it's still there. So start with the cloud, start locally and see see how easy it is. I think that's my number one tip. Nice. Yeah, I don't know if it's a tip, but but it's basically yeah. It's like go go to the site. It's so ridiculously easy to get up and running. We have this cool feature called Playground where you can very easily like 
we have this syntax called acorn file. That's how you describe your application. You can kind of fool around with that and automatically run an application in the cloud. So you can get a taste of what, like what acorn looks like. So it's like, it's very simple to get up and running and kind of get an idea, but we really just want people like create an account. It's free, uh, try it out and then, um, get on Slack. And like, if you don't want to use it, tell me why. Like, I really want, like, if, if you're like, no, this won't work for me. I really want to know why. Uh, it's like, we just want feedback. Uh, so, yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. This is a tip that we always give to people. If you are using a tool, give feedback, please. Um, it, it's the most valuable thing that you can give back, right? Absolutely. Feedback and and remember like to support open source. I mean, it's this is a really weird time for open source. You know, as a rancher, we were just diehard open source fans. We completely committed to it. We made Rancher amazingly free. And that's why it became the most popular way to run Kubernetes in the world um, is, is because it was open source and available to everyone. Just as open source as Kubernetes is what we used to always say. I mean, we, we contributed K3S and Longhorn and projects to the CNCF. We've been pushing this vision for a long time, but it, it's a dark moment for open source. There's, you know, investment in open source is plummeting. People are concerned that these businesses can't be successful. They're concerned that anyone who, who um, builds an open source business will eventually pull back in the way that HashiCorp recently did and the way we've seen in the past from Elasticsearch and such. And so, you know, it's really important that the community of users jumps in and begins to demand the right type of behavior from open source projects, push them to be in the CNCF or in a similar governing body, push people to release open source core, uh, you know, functionality. I mean, people have to make businesses, that's all fine. But the lock-in we see today in so many different parts of our industry is debilitating for innovation. And it, it creates a tax that open source was supposed to help us get out of. You just think of the value of core open source projects like Linux, like Kubernetes. And we have to demand that these layers stay open because when they are pulled away from us and they get pushed into corporate hands, they eventually end up in the same spot being milked with higher and higher costs. We're about to go through this with VMware. I mean, VMware was always expensive, but I think we're about to see another incredible wave of core technology being twisted and twisted and twisted to milk the most possible money out of it. And it's been going on since the mainframe. And the fact that we keep putting our ourselves in these positions over and over again, even with quote unquote open source companies like Red Hat is insane to me. You know, it's insane. And it's just, a, a I don't quite understand why it has become, you know, so except almost like we just, oh, there's nothing we can do. Of course, there's something we can do. We can demand better companies. We can demand more from our open source. We can spend our money with companies that are actually doing the right things. And so I, I just would say that's my other tip. If you're listening to this, you know, this is, it's not over. This war looks like it might be over. We might be in the dark days where open source has been beaten back into the corner by the cloud providers. It's been beaten back by the big companies. It's beaten back by the private equity. But man, no, no, this is not the way it needs to go. Like we can still build great software. We can build amazing things. We can make them free. We can share profits in ways that are, you know, valuable to both the creators of open source and the consumers of open source. And so I just feel so strongly that now is the time where people have to question whether, you know, what their expectations are of open source projects after they've committed. You know, I feel like we cannot just turn a blind eye to what HashiCorp is doing and what others are doing where they sucker you in with open source projects only to then twist and turn and pull these things back and change license models. It's up to the enterprises. It's up to the people with the budgets, right? The governments and the enterprises and the people who spend this money to say no, to vote with their wallets, to dump these projects and to go where they find, can find technology that will be open and, you know, will provide fair value. Yeah. We think the same. We think the same here. And we keep um, spreading the word. So um, I have to thank you both uh, to be here, to share your time and all your knowledge and this awesome platform. So uh, any last words to our guests and it's it's your time. Zhao, thank you so much for having us. This is great. So much fun talking to you. I miss Brazil. I haven't been to Brazil since before COVID. I hope 
we can have uh, an acorn meetup in Brazil. Brazil. I hope someone, if somebody's out there that runs a meetup and wants us to come speak, <laughs> I, just let us know. I'll be on the first plane to Sao Paulo or okay. to Buenos Aires or somewhere. We want to come down. I know Darren and I want to do an acorn meetup in Brazil, like ASAP. So if somebody's got a meetup that they think we could speak at, let us know. We'd like to be there. Okay. Okay. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you all for watching us or just hearing. We see you in the next episode or no próximo episódio. Até mais. Tchau.